All right. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, we have Graham Turk, formerly from Green Mountain Power, now researcher at MIT, uh, who's going to tell us about RAID design uh, and specifically looking at how it affects VPPs, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. I think uh, RAIDs should be a great tool for incentivizing people to participate. Um, in terms of, um, you know, to participate, please uh, mute yourself during the presentation, but feel free to unmute yourself at any time and ask questions, uh, especially at the end. No need to raise your hand or anything. Um, and that th that's it. Thanks again, Graham, and, and go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, and yeah, I think that really this is uh, meant to share some of the lessons we learned at GMP. I see a few Vermonters on on the call, so they'll be able to call me out when I when I make inevitable mistakes. Um, but feel free to interrupt. Um, this is kind of lessons learned from programs that I helped run when I was at Green Mountain Power, and at the end, there's a bit on um, a bit on my research now, which is really digging into redesign uh, specifically for enabling electrification. Okay, let me see. So yeah, just a quick outline. We'll cover the GMP programs first. Uh, if we have time, see, we can go into some of the, the rate design work that I'm working on now, and then kind of the looking into the future and what, what I'm most excited about. Um, just uh, not sure everyone's level of expertise on VPPs. I'm sure this is a, a very well-versed energy crowd, but um, just to kind of set the, the stage here, in my mind, um, a VPP, is an aggregation of distributed energy resources that can provide services to the grid and market operator. Um, I avoid terms like dispatch or controlled here because I believe that any aggregation that's responding to price, uh, whether it's direct control or responding to incentives, should be considered a VPP. Um, and there was, I think, a some LinkedIn post by Godfrey saying, you know, I don't understand what's virtual about VPPs because they provide real services and they're just as real as a a gas gen set, um, which I like because I, I think that they're kind of sometimes treated as a second class citizen as it relates to um, reliability and firm resource capacity. But uh, from our from experience, we saw that that often because you had a lot of different points of failure rather than one single system, um, with lots of resources spread out on the state, that they were the most reliable resources we had because you could lose one battery you know, at the end of a line and still not sacrifice the performance of the whole aggregation on average. Um, and there's been lots of exciting news in the VPP world. Um, just a couple headlines I cherry picked recently. But, um, it's an exciting time. And I think that uh, you will only see more of this stuff as um, we have more DER deployment and more interest in getting VPs as a way to avoid more costly capacity upgrades um, or uh, backup options. Just a quick overview of Green Mountain Power. Um, for those who don't know, this is where I used to work and where a lot of the, the programs I'll talk about today come from. Um, GMP is an investor-owned utility in Vermont covering about 75% of the state, um, part of the ISO New England wholesale market, although it is vertically integrated. So the GMP owns generation, transmission, and distribution, um, which is unique among the New England states where every other state has uh, retail choice in its electricity supply. Um, this map in the middle is a little confusing, but it's showing which distribution feeders are saturated because of uh, the prevalence of rooftop solar. So you might not think of Vermont as a very high solar state. Um, at least when I was there, I think it was number three in installed solar capacity capita uh, after Hawaii and California. And so there's actually a ton of solar, um, which created some saturation issues on the distribution feeders where in order to more, um, there would have needed to be big upgrades for, for substations and, and on the distribution infrastructure, which created an opportunity to do um, to do load management to help alleviate some of those constraints. Um, and on the right is just the power portfolio. So Vermont is supplied um, primarily by hydro, both large and small scale, uh, and then a mix of smaller scale renewables, combination of wind and solar, um, and then some nuclear contracts. And recently, not when I was there, but there was of GMP put out where by 2030, their goal is to have zero outages, um, which might sound wild for a utility in a, a rural state like Vermont with a lot of winter storms, like what, we, what we're hitting, getting hit with today in Boston and 
finally we have snow. Um, but it's really a combination of approaches that includes local resiliency from batteries, um, storm hardening, burying distribution lines, uh, and kind of the whole suite of ways we can try, try to make outages a thing in the past. Okay, so real quick. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Uh, it seems like your audio is a little spotted. You might maybe cutting off your video. Oh, yeah, sure. I can also let me know if that's any better. Can hear you. Yep, there you go. Uh, All right. Go for it. Just stop me if it's, uh, if it's getting choppy. Thank you. Cool. OK, thank you. Um, so this is just a little bit about the load management approach um, at GMP. And so you know, this is on the right is, is just two, I made these up, but this is two days that you might get um, where the goal is in a lot of the programs we ran because utilities uh, in the Northeast at least are charged to pay for the transmission system based on their maximum annual, or sorry, maximum hour for each month. Um, and then for the capacity market, it's the maximum coincident peak throughout the entire year. What that means is that you're kind of chasing these peak events. So you're trying to reduce your system peak as much as possible by dispatching resources when your projected demand is very high. Um, this on the left, so these are just two example days. You know, the problem with doing this is you don't have perfect foresight. So you're using forecasts to predict the demand at each hour and then using that to inform which resources you want to dispatch and for how long. And so a day like this one on the left side, you know, this is where you might have um, you know, a cold day in the winter where the morning um, you have a lot of heating demand. And so you actually have to do two dispatches, a morning and an evening to achieve um, the desired peak reduction you want. On the left, this might be a day with a lot of solar. Um, so you have the midday trough and then a big spike in the evening as you're ramping. And this might be a little easier to tackle because you only have to dispatch once for a shorter period of time. Um, and so what we typically did was we had a, a day ahead forecast. Um, we knew which resources we had at our disposal based on the season, um, based on you know real time connectivity. We would know exactly how many batteries were online at any given moment. And then using the forecast and historical peaks, decide on a day to day basis which resources we actually wanted to dispatch to try to reduce peak demand. Um, and there's no perfect way to do this. I mean, there's there's an optimal dispatch that you can score against to see how well you did. Um, but there is a bit of an art and a science behind it because certain resources that you're calling on, um, they're not going to be perfectly responsive. You might be uh, asking snowmaking operations at ski resorts to ramp down. You might be talking to buildings to do preheating and pre-cooling. And a lot of this is not uh, a guaranteed response. So you're always trying to figure out which resources exist and how, how best to dispatch them. And that often would... It, um, would inform how we design programs to try to get the most reliable response from customers based on how they're getting compensated. And I do also want to mention, so there in Vermont is, is a pretty unique regulatory um, environment to do work like what we did in, in the load management world. So this is an excerpt from GMP's multi-year regulation plan that allows the company to do innovative pilots. Um, this is sort of outside of typical investment um, capital investment, things that would address um, customer affordability, you know, using new technologies and um, just more language from that attachment. So so really the the purpose is to kind of go outside a typical utilities operations and offer things like battery leases, um, like EV and heat pump incentive programs, um, all sort of in the spirit of trying to reduce costs for customers, but not within um, typical investment cycles or turnover cycles for utilities. So these projects would we would file, um, they would run for 18 months. The idea was get a lot of experience. If it didn't work, if I could figure that out for really early before we invested more money in the program um, and try to learn as we go. And so a lot of the programs I'll talk about now started out as pilots and then became permanent tariff programs after we'd run it for a little while and gained some experience. OK, so the first program I'll talk about um, is uh, one that's been running for about five years now. Um, it's a Powerwall lease. So it's kind of a unique program in that customers lease um, two Tesla Powerwalls, which is 28 kilowatt hours of storage. Um, roughly, you can think of like 
two to three days of backup if a home is being relatively conservative um, with its with its usage during an outage. And um, I think two things that are unique about this: one, it's it's utilities own the batteries. So GMP actually owns all of these power walls. Customers receive the benefit of backup power. And then GMP gets the benefit of having a distributed fleet of batteries that they can dispatch for avoiding um, distribution, or I'm sorry, transmission and capacity expenses. And so the way this worked in practice is that customers would sign up, um, we would have an installer go, they would install the battery, we would connect to it, Tesla then managed these resources using their own forecast um, and with full control over charging and discharging. So unlike some of the programs I'll talk about here, in this case, we weren't sending event notifications. Um, these were kind of running in the background. We would make all of our best efforts to not dispatch whenever there was an increased likelihood of an outage, um, something that is a, a huge point of tension everywhere that there's batteries used for backup, but especially places like California, where um, power safety or the, the PSPS events, um, when they're proactively shutting off for wildfire risk, sometimes also coincide with periods that you need to be drawing on the battery. Um, and so it was a good way to learn you know, where customers um, would call in, what we would do to kind of quell some of their fears about not having power in a backup uh, or in an outage situation. And yeah, the value from this program really came from dispatching against peaks. Um, so just a kind of really rough sketch of where the value and how this worked out. Um, we projected 10 years of avoided capacity and transmission costs using forecasts of those two value streams. Um, customers paid that lease. So their lease payment was sort of a, a discounted version of what they would have paid if they were going to go to Tesla and buy the battery outright. Um, and then a few smaller values. We did do some energy arbitrage. So on days when the wholesale day ahead or real time price um, was doing something really interesting, Occasionally, we would go after that as a value stream and then bid in uh, a small subset of these into the frequency regulation market, more as a proof of concept at the beginning, um, just to show that you could bid in uh, successfully in the frequency reg market uh, using a fleet of distributed batteries. Um, but the hope was to grow that and so um, to provide even more value so that the, the lease could be even smaller. Um, on the cost side, so GMP paid for the full um, full equipment and installation. And then there was a small piece that was um, direct bill compensation to customers because batteries have a small amount of loss that happens, energy loss from charging and discharging. And the idea is because customers aren't actually controlling these batteries, um, that we wanted to compensate for that, that increase in consumption as a result of some energy loss. Um, the gap between this, we reserved for all customers. So this, this program, the, the purpose was to kind of reduce transmission and capacity costs in a way that not only helped customers who were participating with the batteries, but also brought down rates for all customers. Um, and in a lot of our rate filings and discovery responses, that was, that was the emphasis, was that this is um, a program that's sort of a win-win because customers get the benefit of backup, and then everyone else gets the benefit of, of lower rates a small component of it, but you know, transmission and capacity uh, are kind of making up a uh, a pretty big chunk of total total costs on the bill. I guess I'll stop there really quick. If there's any questions on this program before I go to the next next one. Right. Hey there, hi. I'll, uh, so for the customer actually leasing the power wall, is the main value proposition the the backup power? as opposed to directly saving money themselves? Yeah, so in fact, that is that is really the only um, value proposition of the customer. The, the idea here is that we, we kind of took all of the value that a customer could get by, if, let's say someone got a battery um, and their goal was to do time of use arbitrage, where they're going to charge off peak, discharge on peak. Um, and so that would be a benefit to the customer, but depending on how rigid some of those rates were set up and whether they coincided with actual peaks, you know, that might not provide a benefit to all customers. And so the idea here is we were going to project out and roll all of the benefits we thought we could get by dispatching the batteries uh, from the utility side and then put that into buying down the lease price. So the $55 a month reflected the savings that we were going to achieve by dispatching this battery for the purpose of um, peak reduction. Thanks. 
Hey, Graham. Uh, this is Jake talking with Vote Solar. I got a quick question, um, and I think Justin's question probably led to the answer. But I see in the image here, I mean, you've got like a, a solar panel connected to the battery. Is there a requirement that customers also have solar, or is this kind of independent of other um, uh, just DERs or energy efficiency programs? It's just it's just a pure battery backup program. Yeah. So th this one, it was pure battery backup. I'd say the the attachment rate or the, there were about 50% of participants had solar either or, either already or got it installed at the same time. And we would always explain that, you know, if you have solar, your likelihood of staying up and running for much longer is, is of course higher. Um, but it wasn't a requirement and it didn't impact uh, customers' benefits from, from net metering. They were, they were kind of two totally standalone um, bill line items. And so there wasn't really a, an incentive to do self-consumption or, you know, solar um, soaking or anything like that. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. All right, cool. I'll go on to the next one. If, yeah, if any, any other questions, just feel free to jump in. Um, so a slightly different program that we offered alongside the lease was one called a bring your own uh, device or bring your own battery, um, not bring your own beer, although we, we like to combine the two. Um, 850 per kilowatt uh, enrolled. So this really how this worked was that customers who owned their own batteries um, could enroll their systems. Uh, there were five eligible manufacturers that we could connect with, and we would provide an upfront incentive in exchange for the ability to dispatch the battery over a 10 year period um, with about three to five peak events per month. So this is just you know one of those events that you see here. Um, the reason it's not kind of a perfectly sawtooth graph uh, is that there's some batteries that at the time of dispatch didn't have the total amount of energy in their in their um, in the tank for us to be able to dispatch over the three hour period that we needed. Um, and so there you know were sort of written in uh, clauses around performance where if a you know let's say we were dispatching a battery um, and consistently there wasn't enough energy in that battery for us to get the full value that we'd already paid up front. Um, there was a way for us to recoup some of that. In practice, we didn't need to exercise that that much, um, but it was sort of a way to protect non-participating customers that um, the $850, you know, that credit is sort of spread out over all customers. And so the idea is if you're paying this upfront incentive, you want to be certain that you're getting that value over time. Um, and so this is another example where we kind of, the philosophy of the rate was like, let's take as much value as we can provide upfront because batteries are expensive and financing them is difficult. And so a lot of customers were able to enroll right at the time of, of getting their systems installed, um, which meant that their total out-of-pocket cost for that system was a lot lower. Um, and for this program, I'd say it's a much higher connection rate with solar because in some cases, customers were applying for the investment tax credit. Um, it was a little bit murky around charging requirements where I think at the time, uh, the system had to be charged either 100% or over 75% from solar, um, which which is definitely limiting in certain times of the year when you're not getting really high solar production. But um, I would defer to any any solar experts on the call to tell me if, <laughs> if that's changed at all with the with the new uh, IRA provisions of, of battery incentives. And um, was it the same as Tesla, where Tesla controlled uh, the batteries, or or was GMP in, in charge of the batteries in this case? Yeah, so this one we were, and we dispatched them through our DERMS system, which was through Virtual Peaker. Um, so this, every all other devices besides the least power walls were, were kind of in one, under one umbrella, where these would be manually dispatched, where we would look ahead, um, using our day ahead demand forecast, decide which resources to, to dispatch. Um, the Tesla ones were more running on autopilot, and they used a, you know, an automated dispatch algorithm where they were looking at uh, at demand every five minutes and deciding whether to dispatch or not. Um, and so the two kind of complemented each other because some of our more legacy demand response programs were were kind of targeted at less flexible loads where there is a need to provide advance notice. Whereas for the batteries and and um, some of the other resources, there there was a lot less need for for advanced um, notification. So we always tried to, you know, any program that we were curtailing or um, dispatching, Typically, it was a one day, uh, one day ahead advance notice, but the Powerwall lease was was unique in that um, because it was sort of meant to be running in the background, and customers you know, didn't need to worry about um, you know whether it's being dispatched for their compensation since that was all built into the lease. There wasn't uh, wasn't a notification given to them for those those events. 
Gotcha. Thanks. Cool. So I'll move on to a different program. So this is changing gears a little bit. This is not a battery based program at all. This was designed for commercial and industrial customers um, who had the ability to flex a portion of their load. Um, and really the the value came out of a very similar pool uh, of, of avoided cost where this was targeted at avoiding um, transmission related peaks. But rather than dispatching a battery, this was um, a much more diverse set of loads. We had office buildings, ice rinks, ski resorts, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, really any sort of CNI load that had the ability to drop demand um, when we requested it. We had a couple iterations of this pilot. And the first one, we paid customers based on their performance during the actual peak hour of the year, or I'm sorry, of each month. Um, and what we learned from that is because a small state like Vermont, where you might have only a few megawatts separating the top two hours, um, sometimes what would happen is that customers were so successful at reducing their demand that it would promote a different hour to the peak for that month. Um, and if that's at all confusing, I'll just jump back to this, this graph. So you can imagine that, you know, let's say if in this first day on the left, you only targeted this evening peak um, and you do a really good job of reducing peak demand where uh, maybe you cut it by something like 50 megawatts. Um, because this earlier peak in the day is still pretty prominent, what might happen is that that becomes that peak hour. And so in some cases, customers were not getting paid anything because their performance during the actual peak hour was zero, even though they had performed exactly as we asked them to. Um, so when we revised that pilot and offered the second iteration, we changed the compensation to something we called just, um, it was sort of pay for availability, where as long as customers were responding when we asked them to, um, which was defined by three hour event windows, we would calculate their credit for each month by the difference between their actual demand and a baseline, which was uh, a thermostatically based um, load. So we, we would have a counterfactual demand based on temperature and their historical load for um, similar days, kind of like what wholesale markets do for their demand response programs, and then average that out over all the events in the month. Um, and so it meant that it shifted some of the risk away from the customer because all they had to worry about is whenever I'm asked to respond, I will. Um, and you know, that put the risk on us to make sure we were we were calling the events at the right day so that, um, you know, it might mean that we'd have to split up some of the um, the event calls to say, you know, these group of customers are going to go from 5 to 6 p.m. and these from 6 to 7 so that the aggregate load shape was, was something that helped reduce um, peak related expenses. And I'll just mention here, so demand forgiveness, um, what this meant is in some cases, you know, customers on this rate were already already enrolled on a, a separate sort of base um, demand uh, demand charge rate. So a lot of these were large commercial customers. In, in certain instances where we would ask them to reduce load, the way that they could do that effectively without impacting uh, occupancy comfort, occupant comfort was that um, they might preheat or pre-cool their buildings or schedule uh, a batch to run before the event. And in some cases, that would actually increase their demand beyond what it would have been under their, their regular rate. And so in those cases, because uh, we were asking them to avoid using at, at later hours and their whole uh, the whole reason that they increased demand was to be able to shed load later, in those cases, we said, we're going to omit that day from calculating um, their demand charge. And that was really important because otherwise um, there would be a, you know, a tendency not to participate at a really high clip during the event. Um, for fear that they would increase another portion of their bill. And I think that, that that came through after the first iteration where we realized, you know, a lot of what we wanted to do was sort of not just shaving one hour, but but doing more to shape the entire course of the day. Um, and having that, that backstop provision meant that, you know, they could kind of participate at full level um, and, and be way more aggressive on some of their, their um, the measures that they took to reduce load later without, uh, without the risk of increasing their bills. Cool. So I will move on now to an EV program that we ran. Um, so this is this is a little bit different. In this case, um, we set it up where customers would who purchased an EV. This was for both plug-in hybrids and all electric vehicles. Received a, a purchase rebate um, and a free level two charger. Uh, and this is a little unique in that I, I think there's um, a few utilities who will 
uh, allow customers to enroll a charger after the fact, but I don't know of any others that provide it directly. Um, the reason we did this really was that we know that at the point of sale, when customers are first buying their EV, they might not be thinking about their charger um, and, and the ability to participate in rates. And we wanted to make sure that right at the time that they were thinking about, you know, just getting an EV and, and starting to think about how they might charge it, that that was connected with the decision to enroll so that as many as as many EVs as possible that um, that were purchased in the service territory also were sort of part of the umbrella of demand flexibility. Um, so this was a lot of dealer education and making sure that dealers, when they were selling cars, knew to point customers in our direction. Um, we had the ability to do a point of sale rebate. So we would actually um, compensate the dealer uh, after the fact, they would pass through a discount and then we would um, reimburse them so that the customer wasn't rating on a rebate. And the other issue um, that we saw was that, you know, customers might not be enrolling their their devices once they actually got them installed. Um, and so we talked to a handful of, of prominent electricians in the state and made sure that, you know, at the, the point of installation, they were also going through the steps to get these connected um, and uh, made it a requirement, what was an eventual tariff that any customers receiving these free level two chargers had to actually be part of one of the two rate programs. Um, so there are two, two rates that we offered originally as a pilot and then um, became tariffs. Uh, one of them was a managed charging program. So in this case, customers received a discount on all charging. So the, the kilowatt hour rate was about a 30% discount off what the, the standard residential rate was. And um, four to five times a month, we would call events like what you see here on the right, where uh, it would pause charging for between three to four hours. And customers could opt out of that and pay a much higher rate if they absolutely needed, um, needed a charge during that time. But we saw that very few did. Um, it was kind of set and forget where most people were coming in, plugging, plugging in their cars between you know, 5 and 8 p.m. And if the car needed to wait until you know, 9 or 10 to start charging, uh, it didn't really impact their, their use of the vehicle at all. And we, we've seen this across a lot of different programs. So it was good to have the, the reassurance that it, it worked in Vermont as well. Um, in some cases where people did need to opt out, you know, sometimes it was, um, you know, because they, they had something later that evening or they had driven their car for a road trip and needed to get it fully charged, but it was pretty rare. Um, and then the time of use option, in this case, it was a daily on and off peak rate, um, but specifically metered by the charger. And so uh, in Massachusetts, at least, and I think a few other states, there's starting to, to uh, we're starting to see some rates proposed for EV specific um, charging at home, but I think that a lot of them will either require a secondary meter um, or the ability to disaggregate at the meter level to detect EV charging. Um, in this case, we were actually getting data directly from the charger. So we would subtract out all charging related demand um, from the customer's total bill and then recalculate it at the discounted rate um, using the info we received from, from the, the two charging companies that we were partnered with, which were ChargePoint and Flow. Um, this could also be done by talking to the vehicle directly. I think sometimes telematics-based control, um, depending on the vehicle manufacturer, might be easier or harder than talking to the charger. Uh, but in this case, it was it was kind of simplest for us to start out that way. Um, it was it was a, before a lot of the the vehicle OEMs had started to open up some of their um, some of their platforms to allow utilities and aggregators to talk to talk to their onboard telematics systems. And I'll just add that on the TOU side, uh, so I think it was something like 95% of charging uh, occurred during the off-peak hours. And so customers typically would happen as they would sign up, they would download the ChargePoint app, and um, immediately they would select the rate that they were on. And, and that meant that they didn't really even have to set a schedule at all. That the um, Within the app, it was already programmed that the off-peak period started at 9 p.m., um, and so it was a lot of set and forget where customers, once they, once they set it up for, you know, the, the 10 minutes it took at the beginning, they were then um, kind of set to go forever where they, they weren't altering their charging schedules um, much after that. Um, I will say that there was, you know, this big snapback you see uh, at the end of the event or at the beginning of the, the off-peak window on the right here in blue um, is definitely something we were, we were starting to uh, at least try to make plans for because, if you have pockets of the grid where EV charging is really concentrated, you might have a lot of EVs on in a certain neighborhood. Um, this this can pose serious problems. EVs are uh, can even if they're not a huge portion of total household load in terms of demand, they might double a, a household's maximum peak. 
And so certain techniques we were starting to experiment, one is sort of at the end of these peak events that you're calling on the managed event, um, you could bring bring chargers back sort of in tranches. So you might say 25% uh, of, of EVs, they'll start charging again at 9 p.m. and then 25% at 9.15 or 9.30. And so by staggering that a little bit, you can help avoid these big spikes um, once, once all the chargers start resuming. Um, and then on the time of use side, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the, the rate design elements that can help avoid this big bounce back. Um, because in some cases, it might actually be worse uh, to have something like this than just letting people plug in when they arrive home, um, because that correlated uh, response from all of the cars plugging in and starting to charge at exactly the same moment can, can be problematic on the distribution grid. Cool. So uh, just a few takeaways um, that I think that we learned as we uh, sort of did trial by error and um, heard customer feedback and, and understood what worked and what didn't. Um, one was, was really that customers wanted simple and predictable. Um, simple, I think, meaning that, you know, not having to worry about the intricacies of um, compensation, um, not having to uh, change their behavior, but really just setting something up and then being able to have it run for them. I think that was really most prominent in the in the EV charging program, where the default for participating in events was to opt in. The customer actually had to take an action to opt out of the event, and what that meant is that for the ninety nine percent of uh, people who didn't opt out, you know, they could just safely ignore that email. On the predictable side, I think that's really about the credits and and the value they're getting from the program. Um, we saw in the flexible load management program that when customers didn't have uh, sort of the ability to to bank on on receiving credits for performing, you know, it made their their bill volatility higher. It made it difficult for them to justify upfront investment if they had to install building management programs or other technologies to let them uh, participate. And so anything we could do to sort of guarantee or um, at least de-risk that investment for customers was was always well received. Um, I think especially for something like a battery, uh, where if you're relying on credits over time, um, it might might be a harder to finance or harder to justify versus getting a big lump sum up front. Um, and I think that was you know to the second point of kind of shifting some of the complexity away from customers to GMP or to an aggregator, where um, that really meant you know taking on some of the risk. Um, handling dispatch internally versus, you know, relying on customers to be responding to price signals. I think that there's definitely a place for that. And I, I think as um, signaling gets more advanced and you have the ability to do dynamic rates, that might change pretty drastically where customers can just set up a device to respond to dynamic price signals. But at least at the time we were launching these um, under pretty basic time of use rates, I think having some flexibility to uh, to dispatch in a more dynamic way was was helpful to avoid you know getting locked into to certain program designs. Um, the third piece is is that the you know the more resources you add, the harder it gets. And what that uh, we learned from that really is you know as you are adding more loads, uh, adding more demands that you can you can flex, um, the ability to achieve the same peak reduction uh, relative to the total capacity of flexibility you have can get tough because um, the, the hours that you're caring about become a lot closer together. So in the early days when we launched some of these programs, um, you know, it, it might be that you have three hours in the month that you can predict with certainty are going to be your highest, and you only need to dispatch your batteries at those three hours um, to guarantee that you're going to get the most benefit from them. As you start building that, that portfolio of resources and there's more hours that are now sort of in the red zone of having to dispatch, um, you need to be dispatching a lot more frequently and you need a lot better forecasting um, to determine when you should be shooting. And, and so that's you know, a, a problem for, uh, for forecasters and a problem for trying to have as much, as much information as possible on the capabilities of the resources you have. But it was good for us to go through those, uh, those struggles early on to understand you know, what tools we still needed to build out. Um, kind of related to that is the fourth, which is that you don't want program design to dictate operational decisions. Um, the example I give here is like if, if a customer is getting paid based on how they perform during the peak hour of a month, um, that might that might impact your desire to call them on certain other other times of the year. Um, and you don't really want those two to to conflict because if you have to worry about all the different programs that you might have launched 
um, it just gets really complicated to, to do that dispatch. And so as much as we could, trying to separate those two and create guaranteed credits um, and sort of take out the guesswork uh, out of our power supply team's hands so that they could kind of treat our, our pool of resources um, you know, as a, as a portfolio where it didn't matter which, which resources were going after different hours. The goal was to reduce peak in aggregate by the most amount and whether, you know, the first hour of an event, it came from water heaters or EVs or batteries um, shouldn't make a difference. And finally, I think that the last is, you know, direct load control. It's scary. Uh, I think people don't like the idea of not having access to their devices, but if it's behind the scenes and if it's, uh, if there's an ability to opt out, we, we saw very little pushback to that. Um, and I think it was a good lesson for us that if you make things easy um, and you, you are responsive to customers, then um, they're okay with, with allowing for remote access and remote management um, so long as, as you know, they always sort of is a backstop where they could, they could participate if they really, or could opt out of participating in, a, in an emergency. And so just a few takeaways, this is a little different in, in kind of how, uh, how I would look forward to designing programs like this in the future. I think um, load control is obviously a really important component of VPP design, but um, I don't think it should be relied on exclusively. And what I mean here is just um, if you have the option of supplementing um, rate design with load control, so having you know, simple rates that customers can, can schedule devices against, and then on top of that, uh, adding the ability to curtail during certain hours of the year. I think that works a lot better than just relying on control and trying to do that all the time, especially if it's something where it might be somewhat invasive. It's, it's smart thermostat control or you know water heater control where a customer might might be more aware of it. Um, I think kind of using that sparingly is, is helpful. Um, building trust with customers. So this was a lot of the conversations we had around Powerwall dispatch, where there was a fear that if we were dispatching and it was snowing out, that customers wouldn't have uh, enough juice in their battery for uh, a potential outage. And so we were we put out a lot of information and send alerts and say, you know, we're tracking this storm. We understand that uh, the outage risk is low because um, it's sort of light fluffy snow as opposed to heavy wet snow. And it always would help quell some of the, the concerns that, you know, these, these two, because they got the battery primarily for backup, that that, that would be at risk. Um, Striving to offer upfront incentives, I talked about that a little bit, but um, I think it really, really helps uh, with with customer acquisition and just just kind of avoid the guesswork of having to do the math on how how they might be compensated over time and whether it will pencil out. Um, and then building flexibility into program design, where I think a lot of these, you know, the understanding was that we would call a certain amount of events per month, but we didn't specify when. Um, we didn't restrict ourselves to hours, and that meant that we didn't have to go back and revise rules uh, every time there was a slight tweak in how we wanted to use these resources. So I think the flexibility there allowed us to to kind of innovate quickly um, and just just not be tied to um, to things that we we might have thought earlier on, but then then figured out didn't actually work well. Um, and so that flexibility, I think, it, as to the extent it can be included in. Uh, in the program specification and customer agreements was always really helpful. Um, and lastly, just that regulatory support was really important. So, um, you know, that having that ability to pilot and to, to get programs approved quickly and then to uh, amend them if things weren't working, I think allowed us to, to learn quickly, um, to not sort of put all our eggs in one basket and then um, to, to correct our mistakes when we were going to move to these programs to, to more permanent status. Take a quick pause there just before I go into a little bit more of the rate design stuff since we might have a little time to cover that at the end. Cool. All right, so the last thing I wanted to hit a little bit is just um, kind of gets into some of my research now, but it's relevant because I think it, it will dictate how a lot of the um, a lot of the approach to, to load management goes in the next 10 years. Um, but I think that in my mind, when I think about rate design, retail rate design, there's kind of two, two sides of this. One is that wholesale prices um, are going to become a lot more volatile as we, as we start building out um, renewables and, and you know, continue to see these, these temperature, uh, extreme temperature events. Um, but you know, under the rates that most of us pay for our electricity, these this volatility isn't captured at all. 
And you know, we we might see at the most advanced end um, a time abuse rate that might have an on and off peak period, but nothing like the volat volatility that you would see in the wholesale market. And then on the other side, so that's kind of the wholesale energy supply part of the bill, is the the network part of the bill, the delivery charges. And in many cases, you know, these costs are rolled into volumetric rates, even though the cost drivers that um, that trigger investment in those networks and transmission and distribution have very little to do with with total monthly consumption. Um, and so we're kind of looking at how do we address these two parts of the bill to both create more efficient incentives for customers and also ensure that as they consider electrification that they're not um, they're not being charged an exorbitant price that doesn't really reflect what their their cost on the system is. Um, so just to see a little bit of this, you know, as generation costs have come down pretty drastically, um, we've seen an increase in distribution and transmission costs. And what this is doing is it, in many states making it so that the economics of electrifying um, heating or transportation is, is challenged uh, by the fact that there's a lot of costs that are rolled up into these volumetric costs, charges on our bills. Um, so just a little window into you know why this is a problem um we have actually a lot of smart meters in the us uh it's about 75 percent at this point across all states there's there's a lot of disparity i'm in massachusetts it's under uh 15 although hopefully uh in the next three years that'll change um but some states where it's almost 100 um, percent and so there is the ability to offer more advanced rates but very few customers are actually paying for them um there has been a nice See change recently where some states are now offering time of use as a default, um, and and that's a step in the right direction. But I think we've we've seen that it might not be uh, a panacea. Um, and the risk I think is in a lot of these rate designs, you have uh, utilities that are bundling all of their costs, energy distribution and transmission into a single price, um, and so you you you're sending a signal for customers really to be trying to bunch as much of their load as possible into these off-peak periods, um, which might have worked in the past where uh, you know, the ability to schedule devices wasn't as good. But as we start to see more and more EVs, heat pumps, water heaters, connected devices that have the ability to schedule um, when they're consuming, those become an issue when there's such a simple price signal that you can, you can have all of your devices um, schedule at the same time. And so these are, you know, same graphs from before, but the snapback problem is something that we started to see early and a lot of the EV specific rates that we've seen kind of suffer from the same problem um, where there's a, a fixed time block where, you know, you have discounted charging and outside of that, it's more expensive. And so at the beginning of that period, when all the cars are scheduling to turn on, that's where you're going to see these, these big spikes. Um, and so a lot of the work we've been doing is sort of how to mitigate that problem. Um, you know, there's some more advanced techniques like just having direct load control, but I, I think the complexity of managing thousands of EVs, hundreds of thousands of EVs gets really tough. Um, and, and so we tend to look for what, how, how far can we get with simple solutions that don't rely on load control to then have that sort of be like a backup um, where uh, when you can't achieve any more peak reduction using the, the simple tool set, um, then is the time to kind of ask for direct uh, curtailment. And the nice thing is that these aren't uh, rates that don't exist anywhere. We're not inventing these out of thin air that a lot of European countries have used some of these more advanced uh, capacity based rates for a long time. They come in a few different flavors. So, you know, subscribed versus measures. You can think of that as um, you might have a customer say in advance, I'm going to need no more than three kilowatts at any time during this month. And if they exceed that, you know, maybe they pay a penalty, but it creates an incentive for them to manage their demand under that limit. Um, a measured charge is, is what we might call a demand charge here, where their customer is being charged on their maximum demand, looking backwards, um, but there's no, there's no decision in advance. They're, they're really, you know, the onus is on them to make sure that they're not increasing their demand too high, but there's no stopgap mechanism to make sure that um, they're not actually doing that. Uh, and so just a, a real quick look into some of the modeling we, we've been doing, um, really like taking household load profiles, uh, attaching EVs to them, and seeing how they respond to different rates, uh, assuming that they're rational and that you know customers are setting these setting these cards up to charge at the lowest price times. Um, I'd say normally assuming rational consumers is not a good idea, but 
we know from some of the rates uh, that have been launched that people are actually really good at <laughs> setting up a schedule in advance, especially for a load as flexible as EVs. Um, and then we test a bunch of different tariff designs. So these are just a few that, you know, just a sample of things you could do. You could have uh, a time of use rate where there might be, you know, two blocks or more, um, a capacity charge where customers are assessed to charge based on their maximum peak demand. And um, what you see is that, you know, this is kind of the big paradox. Uh, so this on the left is showing EV charging under the rates we have today in most places, which are um, kind of, you know, no time variation at all, paying exactly the same price at all hours. And it's kind of unexpected because you'd think, well, if, if, uh, if we're not telling customers when to charge at all, you'd expect to see a really big spike in demand. Um, but what happens is that because people don't all arrive home at the same time, they're plugging in throughout the evening and the aggregate load is, is not, that, not that bad. Um, on the other hand, on the right, this is what happens when you send one of those you know, signals where the on-peak hour kind of dictates when all charging activity begins. And so these, this purple line here is showing what the energy price is, and the red is what EV charging demand is in response to it. Um, and so when you have these really simple time of use rates, you have this issue of all of your charging activity being correlated at the same hour. Uh, and that quickly becomes an issue because of how large a load some of these these cars can be. You know, you might have a EV that charges at home at like seven or ten kilowatts, where a typical household demand for a day might be something as low as three or five. And so, almost you know, doubling or tripling total peak demand for a household when you sum that up over a lot of houses in a small area, it could mean uh, big problems on the distribution grid. Um, so, what we you know, this is kind of the last the last thing here, and then I. I'll, I'll stop, but um, implementing something like a subscription where customers would in, in advance say, you know, here's the, mo the most demand I'll ever need, um, and then managing against that level. What that does is even though you have vehicles that are going to start charging um, at the beginning of the peak hour, rather than charging at the, the full capacity that the EV can go, every house is going to manage that demand um, below the level that they just subscribe to. And so we do a lot of testing of you know what's the right subscription level and how many periods are are the the best and you know how how do we balance complexity with efficiency here? But the takeaway is that something like this, where you're you're supplementing a time of use rate with a subscription, can be really effective at reducing peak demand, um, especially at really high levels of of EV adoption. So you know at at fifty percent, you know you start to see a big spread. Um, what this graph is showing is just the annual peak on a distribution feeder at different levels of EV uh, EV adoption on the x-axis, and so you have the you know early on they're sort of all the same, but then as EV penetration starts to grow, the gap widens, uh, and at a hundred percent EV, you know you you have to build a grid that's twice the size um, if you you don't offer any sort of subscription or capacity mechanism um, compared to one where you know you have the incentive for customers to manage their demand. So uh, a few conclusions that we we got from modeling, and a lot of this data is not coming from actual cars, but what kind of surveys that we're using to um, to generate sy synthetic load profiles um, is that you don't need to get to a very high level of EV adoption before this becomes a big issue, uh, especially in areas where EV adoption is concentrated. Um, and the rates that we've seen utilities start to offer to kind of incentivize EV charging or just to offer some degree of time variation are really not suited, not well suited for, for loads like EVs that can be highly correlated, um, that can be scheduled without customers really needing to do anything, but instead just uh, setting up um, on an app or on a website their, their schedule and then not having to touch it. Um, and you know that we, we tested a bunch of these capacity style tariffs and there's definitely a balance between how complex do you want to make it for a customer versus um, how how efficient it would be if they behaved perfectly. And so there's no silver bullet here, but I think that looking towards some of the rates that have been used, um, places like Spain and France that have, have worked really well to help customers manage their demand and avoid the need for distribution uh, expansion. And so just in kind of a, a quick snapshot of, of my thoughts on where we are headed. You know, this is kind of a look at where we are today, uh, where we might be tomorrow, and then long term. Um, and I think that there's there's sort of this trend towards more advanced rates, especially as 
smart meter deployment gets closer to 100% in the whole country. Um, and then going from sort of simple, uh, maybe two or three time blocks to something more real time, I think um, that's something we haven't seen a whole lot in the US, but definitely in Europe. And then um, for network costs, trying to shift some of these costs away from volumetric charges. And really the reason is that um, those the, the drivers for those costs aren't, uh, aren't really dependent on consumption. It's more on coincident peak demand um, and, and other factors. And so trying to avoid charging customers in a way that, that disincentivizes electrification, I think is going to be super important, especially in areas where um, heat pumps today are not uh, economic compared to fossil heating systems. And this is just you know from a recent report um, that I saw where they kind of talk about this idea of staggering uh, groups of EVs to make sure that they're not setting this really high peak demand and how this might change depending on the transformer limit. Um, and so this could be through direct load control. It could be through um, a rate design where there's there's different hours given to different customer groups. But the idea that um, that sending every every car the same signal you know doesn't really scale well as soon as you you get into a world where um, where the aggregated response could exceed the peak that you you otherwise have built your grid out for. Um, and I think a lot more too of just how how some of these programs a lot of these are. Uh, kind of behind the meter or retail programs where the utility is um, doing this directly. They don't really deal much with wholesale participation, but as more wholesale values become available um, to to aggregators and to customers directly, um, how we might see different programs sort of weave, weave into each other to make sure that they're not double dipping um, and that they can be used for both uh, wholesale and um, and network related constraints. And that is my last slide, um, so I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions at all or uh, if there's anything else I can point you to in terms of resources on some of this stuff. I've uh, I've been digging into a lot of through research, the work I used to do, and so happy to, to try to point in the right direction if it's interesting. Everybody with their raised hand or who asked the question in the chat, let's go for it. Hey, Graham, thanks for that. And yeah, I appreciate all the creativity uh, in, in trying all these different programs. Kind of going back to the something that you mentioned in the Tesla Powerwall lease specifically, but which I think is a big kind of unexplored benefit in VPPs, the avoided regional transmission and capacity costs uh, seems like you know something that's a huge potential upside and and something that would really have to be enacted at the utility level uh, in order to be realized uh, it's, you know it's kind of hard to compensate customers for that uh, but i wonder you know what do, what do you think both i guess i got a couple questions how do you measure that how do you calculate that and then how much of a kind of proportion of the upside, do you see that being into the future versus, you know, price arbitrage? And is there any other groups this beyond those two? But it seems like those are the two main ways to leverage benefit here. Yes, it's a it's a great question because I think you know some of it is could be implemented through something like incentive regulation, where if uh, you know if utility had um, a performance incentive to try to reduce rates and reduce coincident peak, you know that's that's something that then you know you would look at what what do we have in our portfolio to to do that and if it you know, increases per, a percentage point on ROE or you know two basis points then maybe that's the impetus you need. I think that the our prediction was sort of you know energy prices will become more volatile in, in New England. They, they were pretty boring in Texas. They're really exciting and so you know the the values you could go after. There's no capacity market there and so you know there's no there would be no way to build in avoided capacity costs. Um, so I think that we were somewhat lucky that those those costs ISO New England forecasts already, uh, and they have a ten year projection of what transmission and capacity will look like. So often we were relying on things that the the RTO was already publishing, rather than having to do it ourselves and and kind of justify those forecasts and those numbers. Um, so I, in you know in cases where utilities are already in in markets that that kind of set prices for transmission and capacity. Um, 
it makes personal design a lot easier because you're not you're not doing it yourself. But I think that there's also, you know, we wanted to make sure that we weren't banking on values that that weren't likely to appear, where we weren't, you know, saying we're going to get 30% of total value from energy arbitrage when we didn't really have any evidence that that, that was going to be something that showed up. Um, so we were we tried to be really conservative around including only the things that we could either uh, bank for sure on because you know they'd already been at least there was a reliable forecast um, specifically around transmission where that was you know pretty well known five or ten years in advance. I'll just say quickly, I see Allison's question. So the states with TOU as a default for now um, are California, Hawaii. <laughs> um, California, Hawaii, Michigan, Colorado, and I missed one. Oh no. Missouri actually just passed it, uh, I think three months ago, with a five to one on to off peak ratio, which was pretty, pretty uh, unique. Um, so yeah, I think it'll we'll see more of it, and there's definitely an interest among PUCs to do it. I think because um, uptake has been so low for for voluntary time of use, um, and so it's I think it's in the places that it's been rolled out, it's definitely worked in terms of customers at least being responsive and not opting out immediately. I think uh, there's a bigger question of you know if it's going to penalize customers who have the least ability to flex their loads and you know how to mitigate bill shock. Um, which I think California has other mechanisms to do through uh, through some of their bill assistance programs, but in places without that backstop, it's definitely a a big question mark of how to how to avoid um, you know just just setting up a system where customers have the ability that have the ability to change their demand or are able to benefit from it, and everybody else is like stuck with, with higher bills. Um, I had a question about the back to the kind of EV rate design, it seems like many, you know, of these programs kind of encourage uh, users to get into the program so you can manage load and, you know, you gave them level two chargers. Have you ever seen a program or considered a program design that just encouraged level one charging, like um, just managing load by slowing it down? Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> it's funny, I not as like a specific load control program, but I've seen one specific with multi family. Uh, where that was sort of the the simplest way to get a lot of chargers installed in an apartment building was just simple outlets. Um, I think it's an awesome solution because a lot of cars are overnight parked for twelve hours, and you know it might be that might be totally sufficient. Um, have the you need for the day. I think one issue uh, is just you know for most customers with detached garages, if they're getting an EV, they're probably install a level two charger, and then the idea of like having them not use it or throttling charging um, might be difficult. But I, I do think, you know, if you have a smart charger or you have a, a car that's able to modulate its charging, you know, you can effectively make it look like level one um, by just managing that demand. And so even if you can't stop somebody from you know, a higher powered charger, you can make it so that it's easy for them to, to avoid um, setting a high peak or, you know, reducing the, the total demand on that charger at times when you really care about it. Oh, and then real quick, there was one question about what simulator you used for uh, to model EVs, and then one about your reference to your research. Yeah, so I'll um, send to Ben. We should have probably within a week or two uh, a white paper and research brief uh, for what I just showed, and that that'll go into a lot more detail uh, for anyone interested on the modeling. We um, NREL has a, a library called Redstock. Uh, which models residential homes, commercial buildings is a separate branch. Um, and so we use the engine to, to do household demand. And then on for the EV demand specifically, uh, it was from the National Household Transportation Survey. So their uh, Department of Transportation runs this every five years. It collects a lot of data on people's travel patterns. And then from that, we built out um, sort of a, a daily or an annual uh, vehicle profile. So when the car was home, when it's away, how many miles it drove. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of data where people collect this over time. Um, I think, uh, what's it called? There was a big study in 
Canada, they did this for EVs, but uh, a lot of the data is not available or it's private uh, from OEMs. And so we were kind of working with what we had, but if anyone uh, works for a charging provider or knows one that um, might have an interest in <laughs> learning more about their data, it's definitely something we're always trying to get our hands on since it would make it uh, make the conclusions a lot stronger if we had realistic data. Cool. Thanks, Graham. And so outside of uh, more data, is there anything we can uh, we can do to help? <laughs> I think, I mean, the, in terms of like wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I think the I've tried to do some legislative advocacy in Massachusetts, at least. I think there's like just general not a super high level of understanding on, on the role of rates and electrification um, and how a lot of the decisions around heating electrification specifically are kind of there's a big barrier where if you can't save money um, because the the volumetric rate is really high, it's really hard to justify replacing a fossil boiler. Um, and so trying to do more education and advocacy around that and just, you know, if you shift some costs out of the volumetric charge, how does economics change? Um, and so I think that, you know, if, if there's any any state you know about uh, where they're kind of considering to tramp up electrification and offering heat pump incentives, you know, making the case that that needs to be paired with rate design, um, I think is something that does not get discussed often enough and might make it so that you don't need to offer as high incentives um, since the, the operating cost gap will be will be something that looks much better. Cool. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much, Graham. That was really yeah. interesting. And uh, thanks, everybody, thanks for you. joining. Yeah. Sounds good, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks, Graham.